Okay. Hey, everybody. Back again and, and super happy to be here with David. David Post um, from Chainlink, um, Chainlink Labs, uh, running a lot of their innovation and corporate development over there. So super excited to be here with him today. Hey, David, um, really exciting. You know, we've, we started a journey together. What was it? Maybe, I think maybe like four months ago, right? And we've been on, a, on yeah. an amazing journey so far and it, it keeps getting wilder and wilder. But um, <laughs> maybe just some background, right? Sort of on yourself and, and, and sort of, yeah, how you got into crypto. Maybe just quickly a background. What do you do at Chainlink and, and some background on yourself? Yeah, so I, I've been at Chainlink Labs for almost exactly a year now. It's been, a, I can't believe it's only been a year because it feels like a lot of things have happened. So I'm responsible for leading uh, the ecosystem work at Chainlink Labs, which broadly includes investments, grants, strategic partnerships, um, you know, really uh, focused on how to expand and grow the Chainlink ecosystem, you know, especially with innovative service providers in the areas of data or um, DeFi primitives based upon our messaging platform. Or, and also kind of decentralized cloud services. So before I came to Chainlink Labs, I, I launched uh, IBM Blockchain Ventures, which is kind of the enterprise network innovation group for the blockchain unit. And the reason I joined crypto is I saw during the DeFi summer, um, I, I can't say like everybody else, oh, I, I've been in crypto since 2015. I always thought it was gonna be important. Uh, I always thought it was gonna be great. Um, when when, I, when it, I realized something interesting was happening was, was when, I, when the DeFi summer started unfolding. And I noticed myself, uh, you know, if, if there's one use case, there's got to be more than one use case. And this was really not something based on speculation. It was based upon something real, something profound, and something that's going to make a major difference. And, and of course, what, what do you know? Um, you know, probably 18 months later, we've got three areas of product market fit right now, DeFi, um, NFTs, and gaming slash metaverse. So, you know, there's got to be more if there's three. Um, there's a, one to three that's going to happen, and three to N, uh, you know, a, a large number will happen as well, I think. Yeah, and I think you've got a really interesting background, right? I mean, how your your whole journey, right, from from your life in terms of how you then got into crypto. And I think one of the things is you are in crypto now and you're seeing so much in the position that you are in on the second point. And then thirdly, right, where do you see this going, right? We've got three use cases and what are some of the other use cases? But one thing that I'm super impressed by, right, so it's like, I'm in, I've been in crypto since 2012. I think I bought my first Bitcoin. I know it was in 2012. Yeah, that's because, that's because you're, smarter than, you're smarter than I am, obviously. So. It's got nothing to do with smart. So I can tell you that. <laughs> I was listening to smart developers that were telling me what to do. <laughs> but I think one of the interesting things is my daughter, I've got four kids. I've got them all into crypto. I, I feel that blockchain and Web3 is the way to go, right? That's where innovation happens. That's where change is happening. But my eldest daughter is now studying political science. And I know that you studied that. And my fear is that governance is all moving into smart contracts, right? And so what does that mean? And how does that, what is that a future for somebody that studies political science? Maybe you've got some insights given your background. Yeah, listen, I, I think it's, uh, you know, ex I think that if you could classify what's happening in our industry, it's really around experimentation. And what I think that you see now, a year ago, you saw it with DeFi protocols. Uh, I think you're seeing in other areas right now. And I think governance is, is really, uh, you know, as a political science, it's a very interesting experiment that's unfolding. Now, the question is, uh, when, you know, when, when you look back on this cycle in, in, the, in the development of the crypto industry and we look at DAOs, the question for me is, will they emerge as, re as a really a new and powerful mechanism for collective governance? Will people look at it primarily as a route that people, founders took to avoid regulatory scrutiny? Will it be somewhere in the middle? Uh, I, I think that um, in terms of governance, that, that I think that DAOs will prove really good for certain types of things and probably not substantially better than the current mechanisms that we have for others. And it'll be interesting to see how that interacts with a lot of the more product focused innovation happening in the crypto industry. Yeah. And so our partnership sort of came about by setting up a data DAO, right? And so doing and moving governance as it relates to financial and economic data into a DAO. And so, um, yeah, and the partnership with Chainlink in terms of that relationship will be interesting to see how we evolve this and what that evolution is going to look like. Yeah, and I think we, we've talked about this before. I think it's a really super interesting area. So, you know, as we, you and I have discussed, yeah. uh, you know, ad infinitum over beers and, and elsewhere, um, 
you know, basically the, the issue with establishing on-chain data products right now is it's very difficult to get to some level of standardization. And I think that's what was extremely attractive, um, you know, and interesting about your team when we first uh, met is that you're really trying to do this in an area that has the opportunity to emerge as the standard uh, with the infl work you're doing on inflation. And I think it's possible to do that in other areas. I think that what a DAO structure provides here, and I'm pretty confident that data DAOs will work, is a mechanism for aggregating, curating, certifying, and developing new types of on-chain data products. And I think that the work that you and your team are doing at Trueflation is really at the forefront of that. So, you know, uh, as, as things proceed, I think, you know, does Trueflation become the next Bloomberg except for on-chain data? I think that's what you and I have discussed yeah. is we'd like to see happen. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are different ways of uh, establishing, validating, innovating on data products and really making them, you know, relevant and improved based upon what we have now uh, for use in the context of, of DeFi and other Web3 applications. So I think that the, that the path that, that your team is going on is, is very much in the right direction because it solves a lot of the structural and go-to-market barriers that I think has really inhibited the standardization of on-chain data products. Yeah, and so that, right? So in the go-to-market barriers that we've encountered in the past and are trying to, you know, build new frontiers in the future, I mean, you, you've, you've experienced that, you know, working at big organizations, right, and institutions that have been providing this governance and transparency around the world. What, what sort of was your you know, impetus to sort of go into blockchain more coming from, you know, sort of the in institutions that you were working at, right? From the UN to IMF and stuff like that. I think that uh, what, what really attracted me is the opportunity to be part of, you know, generating what I think is going to be the next generation of infrastructure that we're going to be transacting on. Yeah. And I think that as I've had the opportunity to talk with lots of founders in this industry and meet lots of people, you can really feel that palpable energy that something is going to develop that's going to be really important and meaningful. Now, of course, we don't know exactly how that's going to unfold and what the implications are, but I think that's what makes it really exciting to be you know, in an industry that's rapidly moving change. I think that if we were to look back on this time last year, wow, what a difference yeah, a year makes. Yeah. What an incredible amount of change yeah. and innovation. And I think that um, it, it's there's a lot of, I think, really smart people entering the space. I think it's becoming more mainstream. Now, where we end up is a question mark, but I think I'm convinced that there is a world under which, you know, Web 2 infrastructure and Web 3 infrastructure will interact. And I think that at the end of the day, there'll be some use cases and some situations where Web 3 infrastructure will be better. Now, I think where this really gets interesting coming together at a high level is you know, when enterprises start migrating over, when you have decentralized applications interacting with centralized applications in a type of programmable manner. Um, that, that's what I think is going to take um, you know, in order to really make this mainstream. And you know, it's interesting, is, 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 I, I forget who I was talking with, um, but I was talking to someone about the advent of the internet and when people launched e-commerce sites, people are saying, oh my God, how could you try to monetize the internet? Um, and I think that, um, you know, we're, we're probably at a stage, you know, where there's a lot of idealism, there's a lot of experimentation, and uh, you hope that a lot of the core values that have started this community uh, off on the right foot will, will continue. But of course, there's going to be change, because I think what, you know, with any new type of technology, you know, you're successful when a lot of people are using it. And I think that's what our industry wants. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, I think it's interesting. So two things, right? One is, we will coexist, right? So we will have an institutionalized world that works in the same way they do. They may not be as influential as they were in the past, but they will coexist alongside a web two and a web three world. That's that's sort of, I, I think we totally agree on that. And how does that interplay? We're still identifying what that interplay looks like. The other thing is, right, today there may be, what, 20 million people in DeFi. If you then include maybe NFTs, we're talking maybe, 25 million in total, let's say, in the metaverses, etc. And that's going to go to maybe, what, 300 million in the next two to three years. What does that look like? How do they engage across Web 2, Web 3, and in the physical world, right? And I think that's going to be super interesting how that interacts. I agree. And I, I think if you look at consumer adoption, I mean, most people aren't as nerdy as you and I caring about, you know, trans, the block times <laughs> and transaction speeds. And, you know, they want to be able to move their NFT. They want to be able to generate yield on their DeFi application. Uh, so I, I think that what it'll take to get to the next couple hundred uh, million of users is abstracting a lot of that away. I mean, 
people who are in industries tend to focus on this stuff. When you're using a web application, you don't know if it's running on Azure or AWS and you don't care, you want this application to solve a problem for you. And I think that that's one of the big uh, trends that I've seen emerge over the last year is that you know, there are applications out there that people are really using at a, at a large degree of scale. And that's been, those, those have come in some ways, I think, to overshadow the infrastructure that they're running on. And that's what you would hope for. I mean, um, you, 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 in order to get more people into this world, uh, you need to provide a better way of transacting. And I think that's what uh, people like your team are doing, are, are creating uh, more efficient ways to transact in a new type of transactional environment. And I think that's what's very exciting about the innovation happening in the space is that there are real businesses now that can exist even if there's an overall downturn in the crypto market. And I don't think you could really say that in the last cycle. Yeah. There wasn't much to do except speculate. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what's very exciting about the, the evolution of this industry. And once again, we're at three use cases with product market fit. Uh, when the next seven or eight comes, more usable will come. Um, and that will lead to new opportunities and also changes in terms of, uh, you know, how we all operate in this industry. And I think that's very healthy. And I think that's what exactly, so this, this downturn or every downturn in, 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 in crypto, at least in my experience over these last years has resulted in big build outs, right? So big step changes that have resulted in that leap, right? Forward and momentum shifts across the value in crypto and proving that, there is a lot more upside and a lot of room to grow for all of us in here. And I think this shift has allowed us really this the last one sort of one, two years have allowed us really to build out and go from a, a, a single platform to maybe do two or three different platforms into a multi platform blockchain environment where interoperability is really important. If you think about it, the consumer today doesn't think twice how their email works. I just send it to your email. It goes to your address. You get it. I don't think twice. It just works, right? I'm you used to send it to my email. Now you send it on Telegram, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now we don't send it on Telegram. Yeah. How does that work? <laughs> Actually, uh, you know, <laughs> we laugh Sorry, now. Right. I was just on Telegram and I was talking, doing a voice call. And you know how in Telegram you have, if if your counterparty sees these three, four emojis, then it's 100% secure. I was going, how is that 100% secure? <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so I, I did ask that question. But um, yeah, so how are we building a multi-chain world? And I think you and, and Chainlink as a whole, as an organization, have really been focusing on the multi-chain and bringing Oracle services. And I think what a lot of people don't understand is Oracle service, which I'll get to later. But the multi-chain world is critical across crypto, right? Your NFT has to work in multiple different wallets, has to be transferable. And I don't want to know it's only available on that blockchain. So I have to then find a bridge convert it into a bridge it waits for 10 minutes in uncertainty that two million dollars it waits for day. five hours yeah, yeah for five hours yeah exactly <laughs> twiddle 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 and, and anyway yeah so how do you view the sort of future of of, of multi-chain world um and, and and how is Chainlink sort of involved in that and, and and what are you looking into that space yeah, I think that the future of the world of our world will be multi-chain. It already is. You can already see large applications like Aave and Sushi Swap. They're already going multi-chain. Yeah. So in many respects, uh, our, our Web three applications are look are acting very much like you'd expect uh, Web two businesses would. They're going yeah. to different markets. They're looking for market share. Um, I think the contribution that the Chainlink network will make to this is the uh, cross-chain messaging. So. Once you can send messages between chains, once smart contracts on different chains are interoperable, you begin to shift to a situ from a situation where there's kind of transactional islands towards more of a unified Web3 infrastructure. I think that's very exciting because it'll allow different communities to interact in different ways. Of course, it'll allow for different applications to interact in different ways. And that's likely to spur a lot of innovation and uh, in the creation of lots of different types of value. Yeah, because one of the things is is... You know, a lot of the decisions are in blockchain um, are, are put into smart contracts, as we call them, right? And so those smart contracts rely heavily on sources of data to tell them when to act and to do what based on a certain trigger point, right? And that, or, that is called an Oracle service that's providing that data. 
And the reliability of that is super important, right? The uptime, the availability of that so that the smart contract continuously stays available. And that's where Chainlink has really shined and really made a big difference, right? I mean, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, people, we call them smart contracts, but they're actually dumb contracts. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, it's, it, it's interesting. And I think that uh, if you look at the emergence of DeFi, Oftentimes, when you have new infrastructure, people say, why do, you, why do you need this infrastructure? What type of use cases will it enable? And if you look at something like Chainlink, you know, there needs to be enabling infrastructure to allow people to transact in different types of ways. So you know, when you talk about an Oracle network, it's really a way of, of uh, ensuring and uh, validating that the information that's required to power a whole range of decentralized interactions can happen in a way that's credible, that secures people's value, that's done with a high degree of integrity and a high degree of security. Yeah. So I, I think that and that's the kind of uh, framework um, that we're taking into uh, the cross-chain messaging uh, interoperability protocol that we're developing, which is based upon the same principles that you have in order to exchange value and information between smart contracts. You need a reliable source of the truth on whether that exchange is happening in a way that's highly credible in the way that's supposed to happen. And, and that's the benefit of uh, you know, uh, Chainlink as a network is Chainlink is a decentralized computational mm-hmm. infrastructure. Um, you can run lots of different use cases on it. You can, uh, you know, run things on it that, you know, we haven't even thought of at this point. There's a lot of things we haven't thought about at this point. This is part of the reason why we're, you know, we've, we're doing, we've, uh, we're part, doing. we've uh, you know, collaborating with organizations like yours. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's what's exciting here is that, uh, you know, if, if there's a computational network where you can consume data, you can consume different types of infrastructure, developer services, and you can have a credible exchange of value, it creates the opportunity for a lot of interesting use cases. So I'm pretty excited to see how these three features are going to converge or these three trends, um, which are really the, the internet of data, the internet of value and the internet of compute. And, and I think that a lot of that will unfold on, on the chain link network. Yeah. So it's actually really the internet that's actually providing it. The smart contract is actually pretty dumb and, and, and just provides that service. And I remember just taking an analogy, right? I used to do a lot of work in the mobile space and mobile operators were super scared of becoming a dumb pipe, right? Instead, they wanted to be a smart pipe, but I've never come across a pipe that's actually smart. I mean, you know, how can a pipe be smart? And so it was just, you know, um, it's just interesting to see how the importance of the network and the computation and the reliability of that is where the intelligence lies and the drawing down of that and the intelligence lies in the calculations that happen in the smart contract based on that data to then actually execute on that. And I think that's right. where it's also partially where the DAOs come in really handy to then help. What does that computation in that smart contract need to look like so that the output is reliable and the input from the data source is visible and transparent? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think yeah. that's why the work that uh, your team is doing and the projects you work with in the context of the DAO who are not your team um, I think that's the type of things that will be interesting and, and challenging and exciting for, for us all to work together to figure out because I think it's the ability to get the, I think with it, what um, DAO models and I think what generally crypto economic incentives do is it gets people rowing the boat in the same direction in a much faster way than they otherwise would. Yeah. And I think that's what's kind of exciting about this, uh, this experiment and this way, you know, this, this, the, uh, the whole outlook on the possibilities of DAOs is to create that mechanism for shared innovation and, and shared value creation. And I think in, in the data space, uh, the work that you and other data DAOs are doing is really going to be at the forefront of that. And I think one of the things that, that really got me into the data DAO space, if you will, was, was really transparency, right? And, and I felt that um, there was a lot of room for innovation, number one, in taking more of a developer type approach to get real time data available to developers building on the blockchain, number one. And then number two is provide a deeper insight than what we were receiving from the institutions that be um, for um, the data that that was being calculated and how that was being calculated. And so... I feel that, again, it sort of comes, actually, I mean, you've already answered the question, which was, how does that work with the existing institutions? And what are we doing? My view is we're just providing an alternative, right? It's just an alternative way and a transparent way of calculation that anybody as a member of the data DAO can help structure, can help influence, and can help drive 
what that structure and that data should consist of and how it should be weighted. And, and, and that transparency um, is a unique service that I think it will be appreciated by some, but maybe not everybody. And so my view is what does that mean to the incumbents that are providing existing data insights, the Bloombergs of the world, or maybe even, you know, the institutions, the, the financial institutions that are, or the, 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 the statistical bureaus that are providing all of these insights, how do they feel about that? And where do you see that evolving, maybe, you know, given across climate, across financial, economic information? Well, listen, I think that what's what's great about the market for any type of product is, is that the product that can get the most users and shows the most value is typically the one that wins. And I think yeah. that, uh, you know, in, in this type of a situation, there's probably a space for lots of different types of products and services. I think that, you know, for some subset of users and for some applications, having that level of transparency will be extremely important. Yeah. And over time, maybe that does become the standard. Um, and then maybe other more traditional organizations will evolve with it. So I think it's it's really about you know providing developers and consumers with the ability to choose. And you know in terms of how standards emerge, yeah. they emerge based upon customer adoption. But you know we are social animals, and you know it's a, the standards are what people say that you know agree the standard should be. So I think that there is the opportunity in this space, especially since it's a nascent one, to create some different types of standards that are you know quantitative in nature and transparent and hopefully the community can get behind those standards and they can be an improvement over what we currently use yeah i mean somebody was saying and i think that's brilliantly said right i mean what i, I loved about and i still love about crypto and, and web3 is the fact the room to innovate right the freedom to really innovate and i think what happens is and i was talking to an economist actually just yesterday who was telling me about World War, you know, World War Three? Are we going to go to World War Three or Cold War Two? Right? Is it is it that or that? Right? So it's like, which who knows where we're going to go there? But he was saying the winner out of all of this is the free is the West ultimately, or what is deemed as the West? Why? Because freedom is what attracts you know the brains and the bronze in these markets right the smart people where they want to move to where they are free where they can think and i think crypto has provided that same or web3 has provided that same environment where all of a sudden it's attracted talent because there's a room and freedom to really be creative and to, and, and provide alternatives right yeah, yeah I, I think I think you're right, and that's what I love about the the energy in the space. It's that there's so much enthusiasm. Um, there's really the ability to innovate in ways that's not possible in a lot of uh, traditional businesses. I mean, revenue-based businesses are need to be built very differently than kind of DAOs or token-based <laughs> businesses. And the the current structure that we in we're in provides a lot of opportunity to to innovate and test things out. And I think that's what makes this space uh, particularly fun and exciting. Maybe for the entrepreneurs out there that are looking to enter into Web3 and, and build a business, I mean, what, what do you look for in these companies and, and, and how do you sort of, I mean, obviously you might have a bit of a framework within the Chainlink Labs mantra and, and manifesto, um, but what do you look for from, a, from an entrepreneur and for a team? I think that, uh, you know, culturally, Chainlink Labs is a place that's a real idea meritocracy where you talk about your beliefs, you talk about your logic, and really the, the best idea is supposed to come out ahead and win. So we look for people who are intellectually curious, who are willing to have those types of conversations. Um, obviously, you know, you have to have a good idea yeah. um, and it has to be something that makes sense. But a lot of anything, you know, coming, you know, uh, as a political scientist, um, you know, countries, companies, um, it, it all comes down to the people. Yeah. Um, so uh, if, if you have a, a team that has a great idea, works at the same pace and, and is willing to kind of like push the envelope and doesn't have any real sacred cows or anything that's not on the table to discuss, um, that, that's a really positive uh, sign for us. And, and that's, to be honest, you know, I mean, I, I can only attest to that, you know, sort of working with, with you and your team and everybody at Chainlink, the speed at which things get turned over, um, the engagement, the interaction. Uh, has been refreshing, to be honest. Um, yeah, that velocity and, and that engagement and that turnaround is uh, the commitment and the focus, right? Let's get it done and let's stick to it until it's done before we start the next chapter. And, and that's been 
um, truly surprising. And I don't think you see that in many enterprise. You know. Yeah, well, we, I think that it starts from the top with our CEO, and I think that that's uh, one thing I'm proud about uh, working for Chainlink Labs is, is yeah. that we, we try to work in a way that, that creates a lot of value for the organizations that we work for. And um, just as a as a concluding statement, I'm just going to say I've, you know, we, we really uh, enjoyed uh, working with your team uh, so far and looking forward, obviously, to all the, all the fun stuff ahead. Yeah. No, thank you, David. It's it's truly, you know, um, fun. It's been a great journey and I look forward to the future and the path that we have in front of us. And we've pulled together a great group of people. Uh, we've got a great team in at Trueflation and we love working with the Chainlink Labs. And I don't just say that for the sake of, of, of you know, blowing up, you know, blowing some nice, nice flowers your way, but um, uh, it's, it's going to be fun. And it's it's down an innovative path, right? And um, one thing, though, I must say that I really also like is, and and we haven't talked about it, but the workforce not only is our compute force and the internet services and the data services decentralized. Your the workforce is fully decentralized, right? I mean, to the extent that you've only seen your teammates in Zoom calls, right? And uh, <laughs> how most do you, yeah, 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 most of them, right? And so that's that's pretty challenging on, on the one hand, and, and dealing with that is is a change, right? Uh, I, I've always worked remotely, so um, you know, I, I'm cool with it. And uh, but it's nice to be able to meet up in person, as I know we're going to do in Miami. So I'm look, yeah. looking forward to that doing that. <laughs> likewise, likewise, and we'll catch up there as well. So awesome. thank you, David. Awesome. Thanks for your time, and uh, yeah, hope everybody enjoyed this on this call and. Yeah, where can they follow you, David? You're on Twitter, um, or yeah, how can they reach you? Yeah, I mean, uh, you can re reach out on LinkedIn. I don't use Twitter that much, um, okay. and uh, but I do use Telegram a lot. So if uh, if you if you're interested in what you heard, feel feel. I think uh, probably LinkedIn is the, is the easiest way to get me. Okay, great. Thank you, David. Thanks Bye, for having everybody. me.